Okay, I think we will get started on our presentation today um, by Austin McCoy. And I will have um, Maurice, Professor Marisa Chappelle introduce him. I'm just gonna make a brief announcement before um, we get into the main event. Um, so this is a series that's being put on by the School of History, Philosophy and Religious Studies. And I'm the director of that school at OSU and I would love to receive any um, comments or questions that you might have to my email uh, posted here. Um, and we're doing a 10 part series, um, which this is the third speaker. Austin is the third speaker. Um, and we'll continue through to spring 2021. And I just wanted to alert everyone in the audience that we have another event in I believe about two weeks, uh, which is going to be Miguel Valerio, who is a assistant professor of Spanish, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And he's talking about Black Lives Matter before Black Lives Matter, um, looking at a colonial Latin American perspective on um, black resistance and uh, self-help in voluntary organizations. And then um, we'll get more information in, winter, in early winter, but we also do have um, three speakers coming up for winter and you can see them listed here. Um, and also a few speakers um, with topics to be determined in spring. So really hope to see a good audience for all of those. And thank you so much for attending today. And let's get to our speakers and um, it's gonna be an incredible event and so appropriate. So I'm really excited. Thank you, Austin and Marisa. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Marisa Chappelle. I'm Associate Professor of History uh, in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion at OSU. And I'm so excited to be able to introduce Austin McCoy. Before I do that, I want to offer a land acknowledgement. Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River, River or Ampanepu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Um, I also want to thank um, some people who have made this possible today, Erin Sneller, Natalia Bueno, Suzanne Giftai, Eric Glesky, and our captioner, Elizabeth Archer. So this will be captioned and in the, in the chat, you can see how you can access the captioning. We're also recording this talk and it will be posted in a few days on our YouTube channel. And now I will introduce Austin. Austin McCoy is Assistant Professor of History at Auburn University. His research interests focus on social movements and activism, the carceral state, and hip-hop culture. His current book project, tentatively titled The Quest for Democracy, Black Power, New Left, and Progressive Politics in the Post-Industrial Midwest, analyzes campaigns for participatory democracy and economics, foreign policy and criminal justice after 1967. And I can say I've read some of the manuscript and it's, um, it's really exceptional and it's, it's an amazing um, uh, way that Austin kind of puts together these different sorts of movements in, in an analytical framework, it's fantastic. Dr. McCoy is a public historian and scholar. He's published current social criticism in numerous media outlets, including the Washington Post, Nursing Clio, Black Perspectives, Truth Out, and Toward Freedom. And he's also an organizer. He's participated in campaigns for racial justice and against police violence. As a graduate student at the University of Michigan, Austin was a leader on campus and in the local community on issues of racial, economic, and social justice through his involvement with organizations and campaigns, including the United Coalition for Racial Justice, the Coalition Against White Supremacy, and the Ann Arbor to Ferguson protests. Um, so I think Dr. McCoy brings a really unique voice both through his scholarship and his activism for thinking about these issues. Um, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Austin McCoy. Thanks, uh, Marisa. Uh, also, thanks to uh, Nicole and to the Oregon State History Department for inviting me to come uh, or to talk. I was about to say, come like, no, we're not doing this uh, actually at the site. We are in our homes or uh, somewhere safe. Uh, and no, I wanted to say thanks to everyone tuning in. Um, I have friends, you know, in the Eastern time zone, I'm in the Central time zone. So, uh, you know, like, I uh, hope everyone's having either a good evening or a good afternoon. 
Um, and yeah, I hope everyone finds this talk useful um, because no, like what we've seen over the last several months uh, in terms of, you know, not just, uh, you know, this, the federal government's failure to deal with COVID, but that sort of set the stage for uh, one of the largest protest movements uh, in, you know, in U.S. history, right? I mean, in terms of that, but then also uh, the murders of, uh, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So my talk, Detroit Under Stress, P Protesting Police Violence in the 1970s and the Present, is a small piece of the book project that Marisa uh, just spoke of. And what I'm trying to do is analyze various campaigns for participatory democracy uh, in the Midwest. Uh, that is, you know, that concerns, you know, the economy, but then as but also foreign policy and criminal justice. And the criminal justice piece is uh, the portion that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here, load up my PowerPoint and get started. So again, uh, the name of my talk is called Detroit Under Stress, Protesting Police Violence in the 1970s and the Present. And you will understand um, you know, where the term stress comes from. So just really wanna start by setting the stage here. Um, so on the night of September 19th, 1971, two black teenagers, uh, Ricard Ricardo Buck and Craig Mitchell approached Richard Rohrbeck and Richard Rohrbeck was a white undercover police officer for the Detroit Police Department. And Rohrbeck was staggering down the street. Uh, he was, you know, sort of, he was walking near the corner of Belmont and John R Street holding a gas can. And, you know, upon seeing uh, this, upon seeing the gentleman, uh, 15 year old Ricardo Buck uh, asked the man who appeared drunk and I quote, hey man, what's happening? Are you lost brother? And after his last question, Buck apparently uh, jabbed Warbeck with the 18 inch steel rod. Now, according to the police report, which is where this account comes from, Buck and 16 year old Craig Mitchell then attempted to steal Warbeck's watch. Uh, Give it up, Buck allegedly said as Mitchell grabbed Warbeck's arm. The two teens then tried to force Warbeck onto the ground in an effort to take his watch. And again, this is according to the police report that was filed. But so, what Mitchell and Buck did not know when they encountered Warbeck was that uh, Warbeck was an undercover police officer and he was working in the unit called Stress, uh, which was known as Stop the Robberies and Joy Safe Streets. And this unit was designed to combat street robberies. And they also didn't know that Warbeck had been involved in another fateful police officer involved shooting two years prior at the New Bethel Baptist Church, which left four members of the Black Nationalist Organization, the Republic of New Africa wounded, uh, one police officer dead, and another one, uh, Warbeck, also wounded. Yet on that September night, Warbeck was working as a decoy, decoy while three other plainclothes officers kept close watch. Two covered Warbeck on foot and another sat in a car nearby. However, according to the police report, Warbeck identified himself as a police officer and managed to draw his weapon in the midst of this struggle. Upon sight of the officer's gun, Buck and Mitchell fled, opposite, fled in opposite directions. Warbeck claimed that he told the two to stop running. He then fired two shots at Buck, uh, fired two more at Mitchell, then fired two more back at Buck. Buck fell face down on the east side of John R Street upon being struck in the back. Buck also suffered from a gunshot wound in the chest. The shots, these shots proved fatal. According to the police report, the police officers would not discover Mitchell's body near a parked car for another 17 minutes. And then again, like these, um, you know, relying upon police reports, uh, you know, in these cases, you know, can be pretty fraught uh, as, you know, the, this is sort of the, this is the police uh, presenting their own narrative. And uh, Mitchell uh, was also fatally struck in the left back. So the report, um, and this is the report from the, uh, you know, from the assistant prosecuting attorney uh, in a memo to William, William Callahan. Um, the report concluded that Patrolman Warbeck exercises his judgment and was acting in the performance of his duties and attempting to stop escaping felons when he shot and killed Ricardo Buck and Craig Mitchell. End quote. So, some of you know. 
some of this, at least, especially this outcome should sound pretty familiar for though, for many of us um, thinking about, uh, you know, the recent protests and the recent uh, police killings of, you know, scores of African Americans and black folks um, in the United States over the last decade. So in response to these killings, uh, a broad based campaign comprising of liberal and radical organizations emerged in 1971 to challenge and abolish stress. The anti-stress campaign engaged in a multi-pronged strategy uh, which combined organizing, uh, protest, legal tactics, and electoral politics. And, the casual and as the casualties mounted, activists and citizens successfully framed the unit as a quote, execution squad with the purpose of terrorizing black Detroiters. And all of these factors, you know, often put Mayor Roman, Roman Gribbs and Police Commissioner John Nichols on the defensive a position from which they could never, they could not recover um, once the campaign started to pick up momentum. So the stress killings during the early 1970s and the campaign to stop them uh, turned Detroit into a flashpoint uh, for uh, sort of conversations around uh, police violence, uh, crime policy, and you know police reform uh, that would have far reaching implications for the city uh, and for, the, for uh, policing. So, I wanted to sort of take a step back, right, and, and think about uh, and sort of, you know, recognize the amount of uh, casualties or deaths that stress had caused in a two year period. And uh, stress officers were responsible for 19 deaths. Um, and you see highlighted in red all the deaths that took place, all the times that the police shot and killed, uh, you know, citizens in a month. Right, I mean, so Luis Elios, uh, James Hendrickson, Ricardo Buck, and Craig Mitchell on the same night, and Donald Saunders. Right, I mean, this is one month in one city. Right, nineteen uh, fatal shootings. Uh, so that means there was a Breonna Taylor, a George Floyd, a Michael Brown, a Sandra Bland, an Eric Garner, and an R. Rosser almost every month on average. Right, and then. Um, then there were, you know, some, a few officers were also killed on the job. Um, and you see, you know, Frederick Hunt, uh, Joe Riley, uh, and, uh, or Hunter, sorry, Frederick Hunter, Joe Riley, and Robert Bradford. Uh, and then when thinking about uh, the victims of stress violence, um, there was one officer who fired his weapon eight times um, in eight different, well, he fired his gun in eight different killings. And this was Officer Raymond, Raymond Peterson, uh, who came to be known as, quote, Mr. Stress. Um, and he was, uh, you know, he was uh, what, one of the police officers who was, uh, you know, found to have been engaging in, you know, crooked activities. Uh, the last person uh, that he shot, um, Timothy Hoyt, um, he, you know, planted a knife on him, and this was discovered when investigators, uh, you know, found uh, Raymond Peterson's cat hairs, you know, on the knife, right? I mean, so um, there's no doubt that there were officers uh, within this unit who were uh, sort of engaged in, you know, uh, criminal activity, uh, to, for lack of a better term. So some of the arguments that I'm going to sort of, uh, you know, that I've laid out, um, you know, here, here they are. I've already sort of mentioned some of them. Again, radical and liberal groups worked in coalition and engaged in various uh, tactics uh, to, you know, try to stop stress. Um, and then when thinking about um, the establishment of the unit, right, I mean, not everyone was on the same page and everyone, especially being uh, African-Americans in the city, uh, there were black liberals uh, who, you know, actually welcomed stress but then you know, move from a reform position uh, as these killings, killings continue to an abolished position. And then, like I said, um, one of the major aspects of um, you know, organizing in general, but then also thinking about this campaign was that some critics and activists branded the unit as an execution squad. So they engaged in uh, what social movement uh, scholars you know, term as framing, right? I mean, you try to uh, frame a narrative. You also try to advance an argument. And sometimes you try to uh, characterize your opponents in a manner that is that will mobilize supporters. And again, stress didn't, you know, stress, stress officers actually didn't help in this regard, right? I mean, so I will, you know, show you where that came into play. And then 
Lastly, radicals uh, devised and articulated their own analyses of crime and uh, policing, and they contributed to the develop development of radical criminology during the 1960s and 1970s. And this is something that, um, you know, the literature that's coming out that's thinking about histories of abolition, uh, histories of, of um, you know, the carceral state, uh, this part leaves us out in um, those who do sort of discuss um, the development of radical criminology often leave out uh, Detroit uh, and Detroit activists. So from here, I'm going to, uh, you know, sort of give some flashpoints about this campaign. Uh, and because, uh, yeah, there were so much, so many events, as you can sort of tell, uh, took place in the midst of this campaign, took place in between uh, 1971 and 1973. So uh, in this talk, I won't be able to do every single event justice. There's gonna be some that I leave out, some that are uh, probably more infamous. Uh, so if there's anyone from Detroit who, are, who has happened to be watching and listening, uh, you're gonna notice that I leave some things out and not, and I'm doing it out of interest of time, not necessarily out of interest of, of you know, trying to create a hierarchy of importance. So as you know, one can imagine, um, Black Detroiters had struggled against police brutality in the city for decades. And the campaign against stress was the, the latest uh, escalation uh, at that point. So um, you're looking at your screen, you see uh, 1963, right? And these are just instances, the high profile instances during that decade of uh, the killing of sex worker, Cynthia Scott. Uh, but then you also have the Detroit Rebellion, which was one of the largest urban uprisings uh, in the US up until that point. You also had police violence against protesters uh, within a week apart in, uh, night, in the spring of 1968, um, whether it was protesters clashing with police um, or police inflicting violence on protesters uh, during a, while they were protesting George Wallace's candidacy, but then police officers beat several uh, young black folks uh, outside of the Veterans Memorial Hall. And then lastly, um, and this you know, has been the subject of um, you know one of, of of movies, but then also uh, will be the subject of you know books that are gonna that are that have yet to come out. Um, the police raid of New Bethel Church after uh, the police uh, engaged in a shootout with members of the Republic of New Africa in March 1969. And for many Black residents in Detroit, uh, this incident uh, demonstrated a police force run amok. Uh, officers from the Detroit Police Department raided the church where the white, uh, where the uh, black nationalist group uh, had their meetings. And after the shootout, um, like I said, one police officer lay dead and another was injured. In response, the DPD stormed the church, shot four people, two of them unarmed, and then arrested 142 more. Right? I mean, so um, the Detroit Police Department. Um, you know, sort of engage, like had been sort of engaging in this, uh, you know, in violence against uh, the uh, citizenry uh, or the city's citizenry. Um, and the 1960s, full of sort of flashpoints that demonstrate this. But in the aftermath of the uh, 1967 rebellion, um, a consensus of elected officials, African American leaders, and residents, and business elites saw street crime as a focal point for action if the city hoped to rebound um, from um, the uprising. And in 1968, uh, city council, which was at the time known as the Common Council, passed a stop and frisk law. And this law had the support of Democratic Mayor Jerome Kavanaugh. And this law was passed in 1968. And the stop and frisk law dovetailed with the national push for a fight for, quote, safe streets as the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration uh, poured money into states to win a war on crime, which was, you know, established uh, by uh, President Lyndon Johnson, right? I mean, so this sort of is uh, reflecting the, the, the argument and the evidence and, and the scholarship that's been coming out from historians about the emergence and the persistence of the carceral state, that this was a um, bipartisan effort. And in many ways, um, the, the, the acceleration of the development of the carceral state uh, and then later on, mass incarceration was, um, you know, sort of constructed and implemented uh, in many in many times by uh, democratic policymakers. Uh, so, crime becomes, you know, crime emerges as a focal point in Detroit, uh, and then um, the Detroit Police Department's focus on street robberies, uh, which was encouraged by Kavanaugh's successor, 
uh, Roman Gribbs, who was a, a former sheriff. Uh, this provoked police commissioner John Nichols and police inspector James Bannon to institute Stop the Robberies in Joy Safe Streets in January 1971. And the sign officers would pose as marks for robbery. Uh, so again, like in Rohrbeck's case, like as a, you know, quote, drunk or a hippie, um, you know, was also a sort of another stereotype that they tried to um, uh, capitalize on. Uh, and they, these officers would engage whom they consider, quote, suspicious uh, pedestrians. And, and these interactions, right, often turn deadly. And, and in many of these cases, what these officers were really engaging in was entrapment, right? I mean, they would go and they would sort of accost people and then um, these interactions uh, will, would turn violent and the police um, oftentimes would end up, you know, killing, um, at least in 19 cases, killing, uh, you know, Detroiters. Uh, so there were upwards of 100 officers who served in the unit, and the department uh, estimated that less than 10 were Black. And the lack of Black officers, you know, as one can imagine, was due to the, uh, you know, historical racial disparities uh, within, the, uh, within the police department. But then also there were obviously gender disparities as well. Uh, you know, so white men typically, uh, you know, dominated the police force. I mean, you have even had re newspaper reports of, um, you know, Detroit officers, like male officers, uh, dressing up as women uh, and, and trying to pose as women as marks. Um, so, you know, this structural gender and racial inequality, um, you know, sort of fed this racial profiling, uh, which substantiated critics' arguments that stress represented a, quote, execution squad that was aimed at terrorizing Black Detroiters. So with the institutionalization of stress, um, it was top down, um, but many Black leaders and Detroiters uh, welcomed the unit at first. So you had Francis Cornegay, who was the executive director of Detroit's uh, uh, chapter of the Urban League. Uh, he had already sort of advocated for a quote, war on crime in the city. Uh, the editors of the Michigan Chronicle, the Black newspaper, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, endorsed stress. And the Black Ministerial Alliance also declared its, uh, its support. And then you had other organizations such as the Black Guardians, which was the Black police organization that sort of offered qualified support. And Black Detroiters supported this for uh, what they considered as pragmatic reasons. Uh, those who lived in low income and high crime areas uh, had a greater risk of being a victim of violent crime. That was their thinking. And, but by September, 1971, um, well, by September 1971, as um, you know, the the amount of killings are increasing, um, the Michigan Chronicle was reporting a quote significant drop in street robberies. So, a few days after the uh, killings of Ricardo Buck and Timothy Mitchell, a coalition of Black leaders convened to form the State of Emergency Committee, and this was formed to quote combat all forms of oppression. And this coalition was you know, both liberal and, and uh, radical. It included local chapters at NAACP and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, also the Labor Defense Coalition, which comprised of uh, radical activists, uh, elected officials such as State Representative Coleman Young um, was also a part of this. And then you had members of Detroit's black and white left, such as Kenneth V. Cockrell Sr., Sheila Murphy, and Justin Rabbits. And when they formed uh, the coalition, um, uh, members of the coalition, you know, would call for um, the for the, uh, the abolition, right? I mean, so you had Kenneth Cockrell, who was a radical, who called for the abolition of stress, and they called for a march. Uh, so they organized a protest in response to the killings of Mitchell and Buck, and the group called for Detroiters to quote shut down the city, um, and for Mitchell and Buck, and for Black prisoners who had died uh, during the Attica uprising. So on the morning of September 23rd, 1971, 4,000 Detroiters uh, marched downtown to protest the killings. And like I said, they also marched in solidarity with political prisoner Angela Davis, the prisoners who took part uh, in, the, in the Attica State Prison Uprising uh, as you know, you know, the state police there um, you know, basically you know, committed its own massacre on prisoners. Um, and again, like I said, radicals began by advocating for eliminating stress. And at the march, Ken Cockrell called for the end of stress and then spoke of the emerging movement. And I quote, we're going to show them the discipline the men never knew existed in the black community, um, end quote. So 
in response to this protest, um, there was still some uh, disagreement and opposition among some Black Detroiters. A Michigan Chronicle writer, Henry Slayton, roundly criticized activists who called for abolishing the unit. And you know, you see the quote on your screen. Um, and Slayton, uh, in his uh, in his response, seemed to equate activist abolitionist stance towards stress. Right? I mean, so they were calling for abolishing stress, not the whole police department. And but he conflated. Uh, their abolitionist stance towards the unit with, quote, destroying the police department. Um, and this was obviously, you know, uttered without any evidence that the State of Emergency Committee had sought such a goal. And even though Slayton admitted that Black Detroiters had a right to be alarmed by Mitchell, uh, Mitchell's and Buck's uh, deaths, the writer maintained that the crime, that crime was the fundamental problem and its prevention might have, quote, spared the young brothers. Uh, but this also doesn't account for the fact that Mitchell and Buck probably was, like, might not have been committing a crime, right? I mean, um, if, you, if you're only going by the police report, um, then that's how one could come to that conclusion. But, you know, again, this is sort of disputed evidence. So the framing of stress, right? I mean, so like I said, uh, you know, these, the members of this campaign um, and some of those who might not have been direct participants, but then this is also a more general point when thinking about uh, political organizing, um, you know, trying to craft a narrative and then trying to brand your opponents uh, as, you know, either uh, like as sort of unsavory is something that um, these, you know, that campaigns and organizers try to do in order to win over supporters. Um, so, you know, the killings um, and the outrage put uh, in the march, put the put police commissioner John Nichols on the defensive. Um, and while speaking at a city council meeting about the killings, Nichols relied upon uh, you know uh, police stats, uh, which you know showed an increase in arrests and a general decline in robberies. Right? I mean, again, this is you know this is police data. Yet a black city councilman um, by the name of Nicholas Hood, uh, who initially supported stress, he asked. Um, the police commissioner, how can we lessen crime and yet remove the impression that this is an execution squad? Now, obviously Nichols took issue with the characterization, but it appeared that the notion of stress representing a force that was directly aimed at repressing and killing black detroiters uh, would stick, right? And, and since you know the killings of these two teenagers, um, the police commissioner and the mayor struggled to gain the upper hand in the public debate. So, I'm going to talk about the a second flashpoint, uh, second of many, and this one. Um, I mean, all of these points are you know pretty uh, you know sensationalistic, right? I mean, and and you'll like if you read you know histories of this. Um, there's a documentary that's coming out or that should be coming out um, pretty soon about uh, this campaign. Um, it's like you will think about every incident and just think, wow, like how could this get worse? And then like something, you know, worse happens. Uh, so the second flashpoint was a shootout between stress officers, black stress officers, and Wayne County deputy sheriffs. Um, and one can just imagine like, well, how does something like this happen? Uh, so in March 1972, um, the Rochester Street incident, um, you know, this becomes a second flashpoint. And on March 9th, three black stress officers invaded a poker game. Um, that Wayne County Sheriff uh, ran um, and then the shootout, right? I mean, so like they invaded this poker game because they were, the stress unit was sitting outside. They saw a couple people go in. They thought that they were quote suspicious. They go in and follow them. And then once they enter the, the apartment, the shooting, they just, you know, like there was an exchange and, you know, both sides just start shooting. Um, and again, this, the, this, this incident, uh, represented the second watershed moment for the movement against stress. It changed the opinions of some who initially supported the unit. So even Detroit Urban League's uh, Francis Cornegay, uh, he issued a press release calling for Gribbs and Nichols to either reform the unit or to get rid of it. So the Rochester Street Massacre, um, as the campaign would call it, uh, forced Nichols to reform the unit. The Detroit Police Department instituted several changes to the unit, which included more rigorous psychological testing of stressed personnel, and it reduced the amount of teams in the unit. And then um, there was also uh, 
a, a rule that psychiatrists would examine any officer involved in a fatal shooting. Um, but this didn't really stop uh, the activists or the campaign. Uh, more than 2,000 people rallied in support of abolishing stress and various black organizations demanded that the DPD stop the unit. And at a press conference, a range of black groups such as, again, SCLC, the Guardians, and even the Michigan delegation to the Gary uh, Black Political Convention demanded that the unit be abolished, right? I mean, so the SCLC moves, um, you know, into the camp uh, of abolish. And after the march, um, radicals, you know, would pursue, um, and liberals, right, would pursue, like, well, radicals would pursue two strategies in an effort to defeat stress and to try to institute some monochrome of participatory democracy and criminal justice. Uh, so Ken Cockrell and several other liberal leftist organizations, um, such as the NAACP, ACLU, the American Federation of State and County Employees, and the Labor Defense Coalition, they file a joint lawsuit against the police commissioner, um, while Justin Ravitz, um, who you know was a lawyer, part of of these of the law group that was you know trying to prosecute this case, uh, decided to run for recorder's court judge. And so, like, what I'm going to do is sort of shift from um, talking about um, you know, the sort of protest aspects of this campaign to the electoral politics. But again, one thing to, to remember is that these killings continued in spite of these reforms, right? I mean, so this is something that we're hearing about today in terms of um, when activists are beginning to question the, uh, you know, the efficacy of body cameras, of, you know, diversity training, right? I mean, these, like many activists are arguing that these reforms aren't stopping the killing. And this is something that activists today, but then also um, in Detroit in the early 1970s were focused on. They were focused on stopping the killing. Um, and in the Detroit case, it came down to, um, at the very least, eliminating stress, right? As it, as sort of one of the major culprits of, of police uh, violence and death against black people. So electoral politics. Um, so Justin Ravitz, um, he campaigns for recorder's court judge in 1972. Um, and he wrote, he campaigns openly as a Marxist, right? Like, I mean, he campaigns as a Marxist. And um, for uh, Ravitz uh, and this sort of cohort that is, you know, sort of coalescing around him and, and, and Ken Cockrell that's come out of the Detroit uh, New Left. Um, so whether you're talking Black uh, radical worker uh, movements, but then also movements against, you know, against police brutality. Um, electoral politics actually fulfilled their aspirations of democratic control. Um, over the criminal justice system. And Ravitz believed that by winning a seat, he could try to bring some uh, sense of democracy to criminal justice. And according to his campaign literature, and I'm gonna quote again, the justices never criticize their colleagues and bring important questions to the attention of the people. Um, the campaign argues that Justin will do this uh, through maintaining constant contact, speaking to the people throughout the city. Uh, so, you know, he's sort of trying to position himself as you know, a judge, but a judge who will, you know, actually listen to people um, and, and, and listen to their thinking about um, how uh, criminal justice should be administered. Uh, but then Ravitz does something um, that the larger campaign seeks to do, uh, but then also that um, many uh, radical criminologists and, and just radicals in general uh, sought to do when thinking about their analyses of crime. Uh, they provide a, this left-wing critique uh, that is about trying to explain criminal behavior, um, one, as criminalized behavior, right? I mean, so like these are behaviors that um, particular groups of people, particularly, um, you know, property owners and uh, wealthy classes, uh, you know, they seek to sort of, you know, create laws that criminalize behavior of workers and, and uh, you know, Black people and other marginalized folks. Um, but then also when thinking about criminalized behavior, um, they try to provide a structural analysis, right? I mean, so they argue that, um, you know, it's really, you know, structure, you know, capitalism, uh, structural racism, like these sorts of forces are what produce um, the conditions that um, sort of create criminal behavior. And Ravitz grounded his platform in an analysis that sort of liken um, the criminal justice system uh, linked with capitalism and racism to an assembly line that produces criminals, right? That produces criminals, quote unquote, and prisoners uh, via a repressive policing and system of prosecution where the state ele elevated criminal charges with the intent of convicting suspects on lesser charges. And this assembly line metaphor, you know, pointed to how various institutions inside and outside of Detroit's justice system 
Uh, so again, racial segregation, deindustrialization, economic exploitation, under the development of underground drug markets, police prosecutors, jails, judges, and prisons uh, took black detroiters and poor and quote unquote produced criminals. So Justin Rabbits wins, right? He runs as a, as a Marxist. He wins uh, a seat on recorder's court, uh, on recorder's court. And this uh, sort of, you know, helps sort of pave the way for further electoral activities among the left. Um, so his victory, you know, would sort of lay the foundation for, uh, you know, Kenneth Cockrell to run as uh, an independent socialist, run as a, or run for so a city council as an independent socialist. Um, there were people, um, you know, uh, folks in the media, uh, but then also other activists who, you know, thought that he might run for mayor in 1973, um, but he chooses not to. Um, and then there were, there was talk that he might run in the late 1980s, uh, but uh, this, you know, this dream was, you know, uh, cut short uh, after he died of a heart attack in 1989. So the reason why Ken Cockrell doesn't run for mayor is because he surveys the field um, and um, there is one person that sort of emerges as a serious challenger and this is Coleman Young. And Coleman Young is, you know, he faces off against the police commissioner, John Nichols, right? I mean, so uh, he, John Nichols is, you know, in charge of, you know, if, you know, devising and helming stress that is responsible uh, for, you know, almost 20 deaths. And his decision is to run for office, right? Now, on the one hand, when, you know, and the, my, my tone of voice suggests that this seems like a, like a gross political miscalculation. But on the other hand, um, you know, Roman Gribbs won in large part because he had, uh, you know, a lot of white support who did, like in many white folks in Detroit, did support a law and order message. Um, and again, there were many white Detroiters um, that supported stress, right? I mean, so on the one hand, this seems to be a miscalculation. On the other hand, um, if you're thinking from the perspective of, um, of Nichols and, and other white Detroiters who support um, these sorts of measures, Right, I mean, stress, you know, for them was working fine. Right, I mean, so um, you you have this matchup in the 1973 mayoral a mayoral election, and as one can imagine, stress and crime um, become um, and obviously race, right? Like they, these become the central issues of this campaign. And um, you know, Young, who was for like who was a former uh, labor radical, um, but then you know became uh, you know be, was a state uh, representative. Um, he runs on a platform on abolishing the unit, right? I mean, so, um, you know, the sort of radical, radical demand um, in that particular context of abolishing the unit, you know, sort of becomes uh, more mainstream as stress is continuing to uh, kill Black people. Um, and Young also claimed that Nichols had not done a good job of curbing crime. And uh, Young said that he would, quote, run the, run the muggers and drifters off the streets, right? I mean, so Coleman Young, um, you know, ran on a combination of abolishing stress, uh, but also on, you know, law and order, right? I mean, he pledged that he would um, tamp down on criminal, criminalized behavior in Detroit, but he also ran on police reform. So abolishing stress on one hand sort of fits into that, but then also uh, hiring more Black, uh, black police officers um, and instituting uh, more uh, affirmative action. Um, so, you know, young, you know, sort of tied all these uh, elements together. And in the actual election, Young, you know, barely defeats Nichols. Um, and he won with almost 52% of the vote and by a margin of less than 4% of all votes cast. So, you know, Coleman Young um, is, you know, sort of stepping into, uh, you know, Detroit City Hall um, at a time when, you know, you had several other uh, you know, African Americans stepping into this role. I mean, you had had uh, Carl Stokes and Gary Hatcher already, uh, but then also uh, that year, um, Tom Bradley um, is also elected mayor of Los Angeles. Maynard Jackson is elected, uh, is, you know, steps into the role in Atlanta. Um, and, you know, as many scholars and activists, you know, have, you know, already mentioned, right? I mean, like, uh, mayors are stepping in as these cities are declining, and they become the very face of these policing regimes, you know, during the 1970s and 1980s. And, you know, if you're reading texts 
um, or historians like Kianga Yamada Taylor, who in from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, you know, forcefully makes this argument um, that uh, policing um, becomes, you know, part of the legacy of, of municipal Black politics. Um, and this legacy is something that many activists today are re now rebelling against, right? I mean, so um, Coleman Young is stepped, and this is where Coleman Young is stepping into. Uh, but in February 1974, um, Mayor Young issued Executive Order Number Two, uh, which abolished stress. Um, and he also announced a broader reorganization of the city's police force, uh, which would establish 50 mini police stations throughout the city. Um, and no, there are um, sort of, you know, I know other folks who are, um, you know, working on this aspect. Um, I know uh, Michael Stouch, who's a historian at the University of Toledo, um, like he's sort of, you know, doing a history that sort of is connecting this police reform to uh, youth culture. Um, so Young, you know, reorders the police department um, and in the executive order, Young declares that, and I quote, all officers shall be instructed that in strict enforcement of the laws, any violation of a citizen's rights will result in discipline and possible prosecution, end quote. So, um, you know, Coleman Young, that's one of the first things he does, which is abolish stress. Um, and no, like I skipped over some major events. There was a massive manhunt after another shootout between uh, three, uh, you know, quote, an anti-dope activists, right, anti-drug activists um, who were trying to, um, you know, curb drug, drug, drug trafficking in the city um, and, and stress officers. And um, the uh, anti-dope activists end up uh, killing one of the officers, which, uh, you know, creates this massive manhunt um, for, uh, for, the, for these activists. Um, you know, one, like the police track one down in the South and they kill him. Uh, but then also in tracking Hayward Brown, um, the police conduct this brutal search in black neighborhoods um, in, you know, basically, you know, invading people's homes, um, you know, like holding people up at gunpoint, trying to get information uh, about, um, you know, where these, you know, where the, the quote fugitives um, had fled, right? I mean, and this again, sort of escalates, it, it escalated the campaign and this also sort of helped uh, solidify the idea of, the, of stress as a quote execution squad. So what are some of the outcomes of the campaign? Uh, so grassroots pressure in response to the stress killings uh, put Commissioner Nichols and Mayor Roman Gribbs on the defensive, like I said, or I mean, they were, they were unable to sort of um, regain an upper hand in the argument. And these killings sort of illustrated a process of politicization, at least within this campaign, in terms of thinking about stress. Um, so uh, this, the killings pushed liberals from a reform to, a, to an abolished position. Um, and again, the reforms that Nichols tried to institute did not work. Like people, you know, people still ended up dying at the hands of the police. Um, and, but, you know, for former supporters, right? Like Francis Cornegay, um, you know, the shootout between the police and the, sh and the sheriff's dep deputies was a final straw. Uh, you know, another outcome, right, both liberals and left engage in electoral politics. So this was a combination of using various tactics and the left won, right? I mean, they won. Uh, Justin Rabbits runs as a Marxist and wins. Um, Young rode, his, rode the campaign to City Hall where he eventually abolished the unit. Um, but the left's win, you know, would be rather limited. Um, like I said, with Young eliminating stress, um, this sort of ended Radical's alliance, their alliance with liberals. Uh, Rabbit served on the bitch for 13 years, but you know, one Marxist judge uh, could not spur broader institutional transformation. Uh, so it would have been necessary for uh, more leftists to you know, sort of take over um, the institutions of the state to even try to sort of institute a more transformative vision. Um, another sort of shortcoming of the, of the campaign was that um, the campaign was strong on critique, but again, sort of, you know, this is the early 1970s, um, you know, it didn't really, these critiques uh, of the, of the uh, jail system, of bail, of, of policing, of prosecutors, didn't totally go to the point of sort of outlining a vision um, or a sort of coherent vision, um, even though there might've been one implicit. Uh, so, you know, these are some of the outcomes. Um, before I sort of turn it over um, to uh, folks for questions, um, I do want to sort of, you know, think about, you know, today, right? I mean, so um, as we've seen there, you know, we were living in the midst of a 
um, of the largest um, uprising for uh, uprising against police violence um, that that the United States has seen is also global. And this these protests have been taking place in Detroit as well. Um, so in Detroit, um, like these protests were uh, folks were have been protesting for more than 130 days. Um, these protests, um, you know, were initially in response to um, George Floyd, uh, but then also Breonna Taylor um, and other victims of police brutality and, and, and police murder. Uh, but then on, you know, in July, um, there, you know, the police uh, shot 20 year old Hakeem Littleton. Um, and, you know, the, according to news reports, um, you know, the police claimed that they were returning fire. Um, they shot and killed him. This sort of escalated uh, the Detroit Will Breathe uh, protests. And, you know, sort of reminiscent, right, the, the, the campaign so far as, you know, reminiscent of the anti stress uh, campaign where uh, members of Detroit Will Breathe, uh, you know, brought a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit uh, designed to. Um, it designed to, you know, sort of put a, a restraining order on the police over their use of excessive force. And they actually won this restraining order, uh, which uh, forbade the department from, and I quote, beating, tear gassing, pepper spraying, and shooting rubber bullets at nonviolent protesters, as well as hitting, uh, you know, hitting uh, activists and, and protesters with vehicles, uh, using chokeholds, and over tightening zip ties, deploying uh, the sound cannon, and arresting on them without probable cause, right? I mean, so um, this was something that, um, again, right? I mean, like Detroit early 1970s, uh, but even in the midst of these protests, um, you know, this sort of, you know, combination of protests and street tactics, um, political education and legal tactics have also come into play. So I am going to um, stop sharing my screen now and we can move to questions. Thank you so much, Austin. Oh, so much uh, really important history there and, and provocative in terms of you, the, the kinds of um, analysis you're bringing to it and the kind of uh, conclusions you're coming to. So I want to invite um, anyone to submit a question via the Q&A function, and then I can either write, read your question or if you'd like to ask it, I can um, I can unmute you. And just to get us going, I have lots of questions. <laughs> so I'm fine if nobody asks questions, but we do want to, want to engage you and open that up. Mm -hmm. Austin, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about participatory democracy, right? Because we're in this moment now, well, we were then too, right? Where even sort of the formalized structures of democracy needed expansion and defending. Um, and, you know, the police as an institution, as a kind of representative of organized state violence in some yeah. senses, right? It, what does participatory democracy look like in terms of policing? Is it something possible? You suggested that there weren't perhaps a lot of affirmative visions that were being articulated at the time, but maybe you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, no. So um, first sort of to, you know, the, the concept of participatory democracy is an old one, um, but in the context of, of my uh, studies, um, it's, you know, sort of, you know, being picked up and articulated by the new left, um, and, and especially um, thinking about you know student nonviolent coordinating committee, right, and thinking about their sort of internal decision making structures, right, and this idea that people at the grassroots should be the ones making decisions, right. I mean, so this idea of participatory democracy is a descendant descendant of the ideas of direct democracy that are coming out of the progressive movement. Um, you know, so you have SNCC, but then you also have the student student uh, students for democratic society um, that also uttered this. Under this idea, and they sort of in uh, Tom Hayden and others in in SDS sort of outlined this idea of um, Americans should be able to uh, participate in making the in making major decisions in all facets of their life, right? In all facets of their lives. I mean, so um, not just you know going and casting a ballot in elections, whether it's you know in national elections every four years or even local elections, you know every one or every two years. Um, it's about getting together, people getting together and sort of being able to try to make decisions uh, for, make the best decisions for the communities on a daily basis, right? I mean, so this is about full, particip full participation uh, that isn't sort of contained within the institutions of representative democracy. Um, so 
when thinking about policing, uh, so like there are, there's a couple ways of going about this. Like, so the sort of, the his, like there's a historical example of this, right? I mean, so, um, you know, Black Panther leader Huey Newton, um, he writes this article that appears in the Social Justice Journal and it might've been the inaugural issue in the early 1970s, I think it's 1973, where he outlines his, I, his vision of a quote, people's police force. Right. And within black communities, um, he, you know, suggests that um, this police force basically sort of includes everyone, but in the, but people will serve based upon a lottery. So like every single person will have a sort of chance to sort of to serve, you know, in this police force. Um, now, like, you know, people like him and others at this time can anticipate, right, the sort of um, what it would mean to like have a militarized force, or a, uh, the implications of having a, a, a very specialized force um, as well. I mean, so like the idea of thinking about a people's police force in the early 1970s, um, I wouldn't suggest that it would be something that people would think about uh, today, right? I mean, so like even just the term, using the term police today would be an anamatha uh, to many activists, but, but for him it was everyone just basically participates in um, you know, watching out for one another. Um, and everyone serves as, and you serve based upon a lottery. Whereas today, um, I think what many uh, activists and organizations are sort of pointing to are, you know, sort of under trying to think about um, implementing uh, ways of more like sort of systems of public safety around like transformative justice principles. Uh, so this also involves, you know, broader, uh, you know, broader participation. Um, you know, trying to, you know, train people, like train citizens, train residents um, in being able to engage in conflict de-escalation, um, but also engage in a way, like sort of less reactive and more positive ways of, of training people to, um, you know, basically relate to one another. Now, um, this, you know, also depends upon um, what many folks have considered like an abolitionist practice, which means dismantling, uh, you know, these militarized uh, institutions like the police um, and opening up the space for um, people to begin to make decisions um, around uh, issues pertaining to justice. Um, but this is also connected to, um, you know, thinking about economic justice or economic democracy, right? I mean, so, um, so it's not just about, um, you know, dismantling institu like police institutions or carceral institutions and not just about uh, sort of creating ways to, um, you know, mitigate conflict, but it's also about participatory budgeting, right? I mean, like making sure like you have a system where people can decide where resources go for a whole community or workers being able to control um, pro like production, their productivity, um, be able to control, you know, the profits that their enterprises might make. Um, and, and it also would extend to, you know, sort of you know, living in a system that has, you know, universal health care that is paid for by everybody, right? I mean, so, um, you know, the sort of participatory democracy piece, um, there are, there is the criminal justice or the justice aspects of it, um, but it can't really be separated from like the, the economic aspects or the, uh, some of the other ways in which, or issues that we would need to sort of come together to decide. I think that's one of the really powerful things about your work, right, is, is showing that um, these movements were all interconnected, right? No, none of them were, were silly enough to see their issue as sort of yeah. separate from these other issues, yeah. Um, there's a question we have, um, was there a movement of this kind in the 1980s and 1990s? So sort of thinking about the period, I guess, between what you're talking about and the Black Lives Matter movements, yeah. um, what what was the first, where were the, where do you see the first signs of new activism for police reform? That's a really good question. I mean, I think um, when thinking about the uh, these campaigns, um, against police violence. I mean, a lot of times we think about them in relation to particular incidents. You know, so like um, when thinking, like, so when thinking about the uh, 1980s, 1990s, especially 1990s, like, I mean, the big one is Rodney King, right? I mean, and obviously this didn't sort of, um, it didn't totally generate a, uh, you know, a protest movement, but it generated an urban uprising, right? Which sort of then sort of opened up space uh, for continued activism uh, among uh, folks who were living in the area, right? I mean, so like, it's not to say that there wasn't activism before. Um, I mean, early 1980s, Eula Love, 
Um, the police murdered her over a, I, I believe a $20 uh, energy bill, right? I mean, like it was like, I mean, something that we might hear about um, happening today. And then, you know, obviously uh, activists, um, you know, responded, right? I mean, they responded uh, to, you know, these, these killings and then, you know, LA, again, sort of, you know, the, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, thinking about the use of chokeholds and things of that nature. I mean, so um, when thinking about, you know, the movements, you know, against policing um, or really against the carceral state in the 1980s and 1990s, I mean, they were taking place, but um, they were episodic and they were sort of in relation to particular incidents. Um, now, when thinking about the abolitionist movement across these sort of you know, long array of the, you know, uh, you know, mid 20th century. I um, mean, this is a movement that was, you know, taking place in prisons. Um, but then also you have activists like Angela Davis, obviously, who were um, thinking about, you know, trying, like, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean to live in a country that has a, um, you know, a robust prison system or one that is developing, um, you know, like, my friend Garrett Felber, right? I mean, he does work around Nation of Islam and their prison activism um, in the civil rights era as well. I mean, so like this has been a sort of long movement, and I think what what we begin to see the differences between you know then and now is um, a lot of these campaigns again episodic, calling for accountability for the officers, which usually means you know fire them, arrest them, um, hold them accountable. We saw some of that in 2014. Uh, with the murder of uh, Michael Brown. Um, but I think in the latest wave of police or anti-police brutality campaigns or really movement uh, at this point, um, there are a lot of people who are you know, still calling for accountability within the legal system. But then there is a segment uh, and a growing segment of people who believe that this type of justice uh, that people want can't really be achieved within this criminal legal system within these um, within these structures. Therefore, we need to start thinking much larger, much bigger about how we one conceive of justice and, and how we, you know, sort of administer justice equally, uh, but then also um, how do we connect that to uh, transforming other institutions? Yeah, that you may have you partly answered the next question uh, that came up, um, uh, which is there have, has been police reform before. Yeah. What do you think makes this current Black Lives Matter movement different in terms of police reform? And do you think this movement will cause lasting change? Yeah, I mean, I mean, on the one hand, you just, I mean, the, the short answer is like, well, you hope so, right? We hope so. Um, and again, right, I mean, like you go to the stress case um, you know, the police commissioner, you know, made some reforms and what, and, and again, you know, what ends up happening is um, the members of the stress force continue to kill people. Um, and then, and then when thinking about the last manhunt, um, there was no reforms that was going to stop that, right? I mean, so like when thinking about uh, reforms, yeah, like, I mean, the NYPD, um, they banned chokeholds in the 1990s. Eric Garner dies of a chokehold, you know, um, it, you know, more than 10 years later. So, you know, this sort of uh, pattern, right, you know, protest um, and policy, possible policy change, uh, whether it's within departments um, or even legal or within the law, um, and then continued violence, right, and then more protests and then more reform and then continued violence. Uh, for many activists today suggest that there needs to be a path sort of out of that vicious cycle, right? I mean, and that for many folks is going to be more abolitionist. Now, does that mean that all reforms are bad? Uh, not necessarily. Um, so there's one thing that um, you have activists um, who are, you know, sort of, you know, thinking about abolitionist practice, um, very, like they're, they're thinking about it constantly. And um, one, Miriam Kaba, you know, sort of has, you know, gave, you know, activists, like those who are, you know, really aspiring to sort of get involved, um, a guide, right? And, and, this, and this guide is really a question, right? Just one question. Does your reform that you plan to propose, does it undermine policing? Does it undermine these institutions? Or does it uh, strengthen them, right? 
And that is the, the gauge that you see many activists um, that are trying to uh, sort of base their uh, reforms on. I'm going to drop this link uh, to her article or to their article in, in Truth and it's in Truth Out. Um, and well, I think I just dropped it to Nicole, but I could send it to you all for people uh, who want it. Uh, but yeah, like that's the question that you have activists who are that they're trying to answer. I mean, so um, more body cameras might be nice, um, but does that really, uh, you know, does that really undermine policing or the police force? Not necessarily. Um, the police will can can and still will use footage to their advantage. Um, they have the choice to turn their turn their cameras on and off. Um, and it's not going like we've seen plenty of video evidence of people uh, being shot and killed by the police, right? So this doesn't stop police uh, violence. Um, but then there might be quote non-reformist reforms, right? This idea that comes from Andre Gores, uh, who was a labor intellectual in the 1960s, um, who argued that there's a such thing as a quote revolutionary reform, a reform that undermines and that in his context would undermine. Um, the capitalist system, you know, for labor organizers, and in the context of the, of policing, um, one of these reforms is defunding the police. That demand, um, like cutting police budgets uh, significantly, to the point to where you begin to actually shrink police departments. Because one of the arguments that uh, though that those activists who are engaged in activist uh, abolitionist practice believe is that um, we see, um, you know, we see these deaths, we see these killings. Um, because we see more and more contact um, between police and you know residents and and, and citizens and, and non-citizens, um, so they believe that the the more like the less chances of an interaction or the less interactions, the less chances of there being police violence and police murder. Uh, so the defund the police demand um, is one that is um, a non-reformist reform. It's a long-term demand in the sense of like. People aren't calling for, uh, you know, totally defunding and dismantling the police tomorrow. Um, many, many folks who are engaged in activists or abolitionist practice um, believe that this is a process, um, one that um, it's not only up to policymakers, but it's also up to everyday people um, to determine what kinds of institutions that um, sort of replace um, what we call policing right now, right? Participatory democracy. Yeah, thanks for that. The, you know, um, for those of you out there who find this fascinating, you might look into Disarm OSU and the We Can Do the Work campaign. We have uh, students and some faculty and staff on our campus who are engaged in these very kinds of questions and activism. Um, and it raises for me, Austin, this question um, that you raised in your talk about moving liberals to the left on these issues, right? Um, and you know, we see examples throughout history of, of these kind of flashpoint incidents that then mobilize people, but you're talking about sort of different ways in um, at different, you know, protest and electoral politics and framing and all that. And I'm wondering if you could could speak about what you've learned from this history about ways that those with a kind of abolitionist agenda might bring folks who who were upset by killings um, over to, to, it's like to to a more radical stance on these issues. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, I think, and I'm 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 probably going to draw. A little more from my personal experience with uh, doing some of this organizing work. Um, so, me, myself, and and many, you know, and many of my friends and and uh, you know comrades were um, engaged in our own uh, struggle against to against the uh, you know the police um, police brutality in in its uh, Ann Arbor's uh, you know their officers. A couple of them uh, shot and killed a 40-year-old black woman, Aura Rosser, uh, November uh, November 9th, 2014. And you no, know, when I came in to sort of doing this work, um, I'd been aware of uh, prison abolition. Um, I, you know, read you know Angela Davis's you know Our Prisons Obsolete, uh, Abolition Democracy. Like so, I was like familiar with you know the politics, but had never really sort of. Uh, considered myself an abolitionist, right? I mean, because I just didn't really have any frame of, I didn't have, a, I didn't have like a real life point of reference. It was only through books. Um, and 
no, I think there are multiple paths towards one politicization, but then two radicalization. Um, and one path is like, this is now, this might be where, you know, some of these videos um, come into play. Um, I mean, I think my introduction to police violence um, was the Rodney King video. Um, that was my introduction to police violence and the sort of, and, and the reaction and like the reactions to it, whether it was um, through, um, you know, actual writing or whether it was through music, right? I mean, like, I mean, hip hop culture really responded, responded to that situation at the time. Um, so, you know, watching these videos, and I think this is what happened recently with the George Floyd murder. Um, I think um, everyone being inside, um, you know, and watching this video and watching the officer's face and watching everyone sort of respond to the situation and listen, and hearing George Floyd cry out um, was politic like it politicized a lot of people. And I think it radicalized a lot of people. Um, and the thing that, you know, something I have to keep in mind and many of, you know, from, and just to speak for myself is right, is this process is, um, it takes time. Uh, so in 2014, um, when many of us were organizing, I mean, our demands, um, they were, you know, to fire the officer, um, to uh, make sure that the city pays for um, the, the families, uh, for Roster's funeral, um, give some sort of restitution, um, and then just apologize, right? I mean, just apologize, just acknowledge um, that the police committed an act of murder, right? Not just say, well, this was a tragedy and be passive about it, admit to what the police did. Um, and we got none of those things, right? Like, I mean, we got none of those things. I mean, we, we you know, folks marched in the street, um, you know, we attended city council meetings, um, we disrupted city council meetings. Um, we, some of some folks met with city council people. Uh, so we had, you know, members who were um, working with the human rights commission on a citizen review board. Um, we went through many different paths and, you know, at the end of it, in some ways, like, I mean, we were able to win a citizen review board, but it has no teeth, right? I mean, so like going through the actual political process can be one of the most radicalizing things that anyone can ever do, right? I mean, and um, this, you know, and we had a lot of arguments about this. I mean, because we had uh, folks who were more anarchists who were like, we have, we don't want any sort of uh, relationship with any elected official. We don't want to be in the room in, in in the room with any police, et cetera, et cetera. And you had some folks who were who really wanted to engage the system, and we kind of did both. And no, what ended up happening was we watched the police, we watched the system defend itself. We watched uh, the mayor defend the police. We watched the police union, um, you know, defend the police. Um, you know, there were some reforms uh, that were instituted in response to protests, like diversity training. But again, right, I mean, like this, you know, the police continued to, um, you know, you know, brutalize people. Like there were, you know, instances of a, a few brutal arrests um, that took place afterwards. Uh, so going through the process radicalized many of us, including myself. Um, and I think, you know, like it's, that's sort of where, where you have to pay attention to, right? I mean, so um, one, you had, you know, these videos that can politicize. Um, I wish it would just be, people organizing, telling people about this that would politicize them more, but sometimes these videos do that, um, but then going through the system and going against the system um, and trying to go around the system, like all these things will, will help radicalize um, those who might not have been before. Um, so no, a lot of times, yeah, like many of us, we, we get frustrated and, you know, post wild things on social media, um, but a lot of times it's actually, you know, my, what I do with folks is I, you know, I'm, I'm there to, you know, sort of, if they want any advice about organizing, like I can give it to them and they ask, but you go through the system, you go through the process yourself. Um, and a lot of times you will come out uh, more radical because you just understand that um, the police, the institutions of law enforcement, uh, that, you know, and, and mayors and city councils, they're not really interested in, in trying to uh, create a police force that would be less violent. It's a really good reminder of something we have to keep reminding ourselves, I think, is that people are uh, politicized through struggle, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Um, I want to mention real quick um, a, a comment that tasers are also a problem in Hawaii in particular, so yeah. another um, aspect of this. Um, we are really at time, over time. I want to thank you so much, Dr. McCoy, for sharing with us your research and your insights and your wisdom. Um, and thank you everyone else for being here and hope to see you at the next um, of the Cabildos um, talks. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have a good night.